Part six, chapter 17, Puja at Base Camp. Tomorrow we'll have our Puja. Bring your harnesses, crampons, ice axes, anything with a sharp point on it, bring it to the ceremony, John Paul announced over a dinner of lamb and rice and tomato soup. Jim stood up. Everyone looked at him, not sure what to expect. <clears throat> Last year at our Puja, I was changed. I was skeptical of these type of ceremonies here and back home. But I saw the seriousness in which the climbing Sherpas took the Puja. And it caused me to look at them differently. Even more respect. Even more admiration. So if you don't want to participate, that's okay. After all, it's really for the Sherpas. But they welcome us to join. Breakfast came early as the cooks and the Sherpas were anxious to start the ceremonies. The Sherpas had spent the previous day collecting large, flattish stones to build a rock altar. It was back-breaking work, but they laughed, they smiled as they were doing it. The stone stupa held a flagpole, several revered pictures, including one of the Dalai Lama. Climbers sat on blankets laid on the rock behind the Lama. Ceremonies mark life. Many come with the birth of a child, the union of a couple, or upon a death. Today was a ceremony to climb a mountain. But as with all ceremonies, it meant much, it meant much more to those involved. The puja is a traditional ceremony led by a lama, where the mountain gods are asked permission for the climbers to climb, forgiveness for the damage caused by the climbing, and safety for everyone involved. All the Sherpas, climbers, cooks, anyone associated with the climb, they're invited to participate or just to observe. This morning was warm and bright, much different than the past few days. Over breakfast, the team smelled smoldering juniper boughs that enveloped the camp. As time came for the ceremony to begin, the Sherpas moved with an air of excitement and purpose. The team moved to the highest point in the camp where the large altar sat. The couple left their tent and walked towards the altar. Oh, I forgot my harness, Pablo said. Yeah, I forgot my ice axe. Will you get it for me? Claudia added. They were looking forward to the puja, having never attended one. They spent hours on the trail talking with Dabo, listening with interest as he tried to explain some of his Buddhist beliefs and traditions, how he respected other, other people's beliefs and never tried to change them, and never tried to convert anyone to Buddhism. The couple later agreed the time with Dawa opened their eyes to a different culture and how they practiced life. Got him, Pablo said, catching up with his mate. The climbing harnesses were blessed for safety, the ice axes and crampons for forgiveness for the holes the climbers would put in the mountain. Michael and two new climbers who had taken to different trek to base camp brought pictures of their families and placed them on the altar. They planned to leave them on the summit. The Lama sat to the far left of the altar. He sat on three blankets on the ground and had another one wrapped around his legs. He was Mingma Dorja Sherpi, Sherpa, a Lama from Pengboche, and he had been conducting puja for years. To his right sat several Sherpa who assisted with the puja. The Lama had a pair of small cymbals that he clanged throughout the ceremony, as did a Sherpa with a small drum. The constant accompaniment of music made it perfect match to the chanting. The Lama began the puja by reading from a 300-year-old Tibetan prayer book. The Sherpas joined in, all chanting in unison. The climbers sat in rows behind the Lama, and everyone else mingled around. The ceremony had a serious tone, but it wasn't that terminally so. Cameras, shutters, video cameras were in full action trying to capture the moment. Dutch just sat quietly, his socked feet on top of his thighs, his hands placed in his lap. Dutch closed his eyes and let the smell of the juniper and the sound of the chanting soak into his essence. He had never felt this way. All the senses were alive and stimulated all at the same time. He was very much at peace. The Sherpas walked the area serving everyone milk tea, a sweet concoction of sugar, milk, and tea. The Lama and his Sherpas drank milk tea and Chang, a potent rice wine. The Lama, with help from the team, cooks and prepared the food, including baking and creating food sculptures the night before. Trays of cookies, breads, and other sweets set by the altar. The prayer went on for two hours. Once completed, the Sherpas then jumped into action. Two took an eight-foot-long pine tree trunk, the puja pole, and lifted it atop the altar. They dropped it into a, into a crack on the stone altar top. Prayer flags had already been attached to the top. 
then the other Sherpas took the end of the string of, of flags and went to multiple points around the camp so that each string fluttered over the tents. Harper watched in amazement at their precision design so that every tent had a flag over it. They were careful to treat the prayer flags with reverence. Once the pole was up, a black Himalayan chuff promptly flew over and perched on top of it. It was a sign of good luck. The Sherpa smiled in agreement. The energy increased with more tea and chang filling everyone's cups without coordination, but at the same time, the Lama and the Sherpas by his side stood up with another series of chants, three series of low growls. Arr, meant victory to the gods. In other words, the gods had granted their, their, their wishes for permission, forgiveness, and safety. At the end of the third growl, everyone threw rice in the air three times, an auspicious number of times, and began cheering. As the enthusiasm picked up even more, Dawa grabbed a bowl of Sampa, roasted barley powder. He went from person to person, climbers, cooks, John Paul, Sherpas, anyone around had their cheeks lathered with the white powder. It was white because it symbolized a white beard that comes with old age. Then another Sherpa came by with a bottle of Johnny Walker whiskey. <laughs> Each person just held the bottle cap while Sherpa, Mima this time, filled it up. He paused longer with hers, his charge. Carefully, Harper performed the ceremony correctly. As instructed, Michael put one fingertip into the cap, threw the drops over his shoulder three times, and he drank the rest from the cap. When offered, Tony just shook his head no. The Sherpa smiled and moved on. With the formal part of the puja complete, the Sherpa started serving more drinks, beer, whiskey, soda, water, along with the pastry the Lama had cooked the night before. And the Sherpas began to form a Sherpa dance, a long line of dancing with precision footwork. Jim tried to join, but he had trouble keeping up. The couple stepped away from the group to observe. You can see how everyone's coming together, Claudia said. This puja was about the Sherpas, but they included everyone. They shared their food, embraced one another in the line dance, smiled so easily and laughed sincerely. Yet there's a seriousness and a conviction to their efforts that everyone felt who attended the ceremony. I agree, Pablo said, adding, these Sherpas are affirming their dedication to one another on yet another dangerous climb of the highest mountain on earth. In recent years, more Sherpas have died on Everest than non-Sherpas. They know too well that this ceremony was certainly to honor and make a request to the mountain gods, but it was also to commit themselves to each other, to be there when needed, to support and be supported when the time came. Standing nearby, John Paul joined the couple. The puja is an important part of the expedition to me. It's a Buddhist blessing, and for me, it's always important to respect the culture of the place I'm visiting. At first, I did it mainly for the locals. Now I feel I want to do it for myself. I hope this will provide us with good luck. I guess we'll see. Chapter 18, It Takes a Village. The team spent the day practicing skills on a course set up by the climbing Sherpas next to base camp. They had a fixed wall. They had fixed a rope up a steep snow wall used for ascending and repelling. Two ladders spanned a small crevasse where the team practiced crossing wearing their 8,000 meter mountaineering boots and crampons. It was a productive day where everyone learned something or updated old skills. Michael and Jim walked side by side back to camp. Hell, I remember crossing my first ladder last year, Jim started. I went so slow that the Sherpa started laughing at me. I deserved it. I started laughing at myself. I was so afraid of falling. There were 15 crossings, most only one or two ladders, but near the top of the icefall, well, the docks had lashed five ladders together so we mortals could get up the 30-foot ice cliff. Anyway, after crossing a few of these, I got used to it, and the fear went away. Michael picked it up. I felt okay on the ladder practice today, but jugging up that rope on the little wall, that was tough. I did what Dawa, Dawa told me to do, you know, climb with my legs, not pull with my arms. He said to stick the front points in hard, sticking them into the ice, and don't have a death grip on the Jumar. But I felt like I was a baby elephant of wobbling legs hanging on for dear life with my short trunk gripped to that damn tiny line. What am I going to do when it's the real deal? Back at camp, everyone retreated to the silence of their tents. Most took a nap. Some slept hard, as demonstrated by Michael's loud, booming snores. Base camp is huge. I bet there's a thousand people here. Why so many? I thought Nepal only issued about 300 permits a year, Dutch had asked the team over dinner. The two new members of the team, affectionately known as buddies, that is Aaron and Bart, 
they had met the rest of the group at base camp. They trekked in, a, not with everyone else, but they went their own way by Gokio Lakes and the Chula Pass. The pair had climbed together a lot around the world, almost on every continent. Back home, they ran a climbing business together. Well, this is our first time to EBC, but from what I know, there are a bunch of reasons for all these people. First, like, everyone has a climbing Sherpa. So that's 10 more just for us. Then we have five people in the cook tent between the cook and the guys who haul water up here every day. John Paul told me that we have five additional five Sherpas who do nothing but haul gear up to the high camps. You know, tent, stove, oxygen kit. So if I got the math right, we have over 30 people just in our camp. John Paul chimed in. That's about right. This year, there's about 32 teams here. Most, maybe 25, are about our size, so that's already up to 750 people. Then there are the large teams, 50, 60, even 100 members along with their support. So that's another few hundred. Yeah, I think we're well over 1,000 here at base camp. About that time, Chongba, the base camp cook, walked in to see if dinner was okay and if anyone needed anything else or any more. Man met him with a round of applause. He had been cooking in expeditions in pre- and post-monsoon seasons for 15 years. His English was excellent. Listening to the conversation, he noted, don't forget that there are porters who bring in fresh vegetables, eggs, and some meat from the lower village almost every day. Often they stay the night. Also the yak drivers. Oh, and that guy who hauls our, the blue barrels away with our poop in it every few days? Yeah, don't forget about him. The buddy said in unison, holy shit, I'll never complain about my job again. Everyone laughed, but also said a silent thank you to the blue barrel man. One of the buddies coughed. He coughed hard and loud. Everyone paused looking at him. I'm okay. It's just a bit of a cough. Harper, Harper spoke up. What about Everest Hospital? They have a volunteer team of about five people who do medical stuff. The hospital provided medical services to the climbers for a flat fee of $100 for the season. Often the guide companies will pay for all their climbers instead of hiring a doctor just for one team. However, the hospital treated any porter, any Sherpa, any local Nepali at no charge. This was the 25th year of providing the service. Dawa came in hearing the laughter and conversation. You forget about another group that with or without them, none of us would be here climbing Everest from this side. On the Nepal side, the Icefall doctors were a team of eight dedicated climbing Sherpas that install, in other words, they fix the route from Everest Base Camp to Camp 2 in the Western Coombe each year. The docks first scout out the icefall for the safest and most direct path. Then they carry on their backs hundreds of pounds of ropes, ladders, ice screws, and pickets up the icefall into the western coom to create the route. The ropes must be reset each season because the ultraviolet rays from the sun rot the nylon, causing them to fail under the weight of a climber's fall. Also, the route must ma be maintained daily throughout the season given the icefall is a moving glacier. It can move up to three feet a day. This movement causes the ladders to drop into crevasses and bends them or moves them into dangerous areas. The doctors inspect the route at least once a day throughout the season to keep it open and safe. Without the doctors, no one would be climbing from this side. From Camp 2 to the summit on the south side, a dedicated group of different climbing Sherpas set the route. In a significant safety move for this year, the Nepal Tourism Ministry approved using a helicopter to ferry ropes and anchors to Camp 2 for the route to the summit. Before it was hauled up by Sherpas inc and increased the risk of an accident like happened in 2014 by reducing the number of trips through the icefall. Buddies joined the conversation. What about those people that say they climb solo? If they use ladders and ropes, are they still solo? John Paul rubbing his forehead seemed uncomfortable. Well, in my view, the only person who is so low to Everest was Messner in 1990, and that was over on the other side of the mountain, the Northeast Ridge. There were no ladders, ropes, or other people in the route. He truly was on his own. Today, people can climb without Sherpa support or teammates, but unless they go out of their way not to follow a boot path or use a ladder or a fixed line in steep places, eh, they're still unsupported, but they're not solo. I know this is a controversial thing like using oxygen, but our sport is filled with egos. When will the ropes reach the summit, Tony asked. Everyone looked at him because it was the first question he had asked all trip. Dawa stepped up. Usually it's in by early May. The docks already have the route to Camp Troop 2, and the helicopters should take the gear up in the next few days. There are already a few teams at Camp 2 on their rotation, so I think this year will be about the same. I think around May 5th, the ropes will summit. Does that mean we can summit early? Back in Kathmandu, you said we have summoned on May 19th. 
The Dutch was excited about the possibility and spoke with great anticipation. Hold on now, John Paul jumped back in. We have a lot of work to do before we start talking summits. We've got at least two rotations of Camp 2, including that camp, the trip to Camp 3 we talked about. And then there's the weather. We've had an unusually good period of weather thus far, but traditionally it turns rough in early May. Also, to be honest, I don't want to be first. I'm happy to let some of the eager teams go up and find out the route conditions. Let the huge teams get out of the way. We'll play it safe and slow. Patience is the play here. Remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. I'd be happy to be last. Tony looked alarmed. Dutch looked disappointed. However, Jim and Michael looked relieved. Buddies just took it all in. Harper thought about calling home. The couple holding hands squeeze each other harder. Listen up, everyone. Tomorrow's a big day. We go to the football field and the ice field and back down. A little test run. After a rest day, then we'll head up to Camp 1 for the night and then Camp 2 for four nights. Time to get your head in the games. Up at 2, breakfast at 2.30, walking at 3. Don't be that person we have to wait on, John Paul told the group. The couple looked at each other. Harper looked over at Dutch. He looked at Tony, who smiled for the first time on the trip. Chapter 19, First Steps in the Kumbu Icefall. Try to keep it down tonight. We need our sleep, Harper and Dutch asked Michael. Yeah, I'll do my best, but I really can't control it, he sneered. We may have to move his tent due to his snoring, Dutch said quietly. Inside their tents, they packed up for the short trip of the Kumbu Icefall. They planned to leave at four tomorrow morning. Their boots were parked outside in their vestibules. Liners would go inside the sleeping bag to keep them warm. They didn't need very much for this trip, a water bottle, a few snacks, a couple extra layers. However, they would be wearing most of their gear, their base layers or climbing pants, climbing shirt, gloves, hat, sunglasses around their neck. They would start in a medium weight down jacket, but have their Gore-Tex shell and pack along with their mittens. That was always in their pack. As Harper got ready to crawl in her 20 degree, degree below zero sleeping bag, she searched for a picture. Harper turned the album, the, each page in that, her picture album slowly. She looked in their eyes, their smiles, their expressions. God, Harper missed her family. And she'd only been gone for a little over two weeks. She fluffed her pillow, put in her earplugs, pulled the knit cap, over them, hoping that would keep them in. Harper said, good night, boys. <laughs> Harper set her alarm for 3 a.m., knowing it was unnecessary, just hoping to get a couple of hours of rest. The Kumbu Icefall. Oh, Harper had seen so many pictures, watched videos, recently studied it from Kalapatar and now from her, from her base camp tent. But now she was going to do it for the real first time, the real deal. Switching on her headlamp, she pulled on her climbing clothes. This was just a trip halfway up, but it still required warm layers and technical gears, crampons, harnesses, jumar, cow's tail, ice axe to works. The three-person tent seemed big when Harper arrived, but now it felt like a closet. She swung her legs off her mattress to pull on her pants and lifted her arms up high to wiggle on her top. Next came the warm boot liners. <sighs> she was glad that she kept in her sleeping bag overnight. Scooting to, the, scooting to the door, Harper pulled on her outer boots. Finally dressed for action, she stumbled out of her tent, only to trip over a line. <laughs> Laughing, Harper said, am I going to go climb Everest? <laughs> Standing in the cold, crisp air, she paused. Looking around, Harper saw a team, all of her teammates performing the same circus act. Looking at her red 8,000-meter boots, the contrast was sharp against the white snow. Without thinking, a smile grew on her face. Harper was about to enter the icefall. Glancing at the icefall, Harper could see headlamps. Hmm, someone was already up there, probably Sherpas carrying a load to camp one or two. She could hear the low hiss of stoves as the cooks were already making breakfast in the middle of the night. The Sherpas gathered by the, the cook tent. They were eating some unidentified concoction of rice, milk, and sugar. They ate it with the enthusiasm of a starving teenager. As Harper walked over and entered the dining tent, the cooks had already brought out toast and boiled egg for each climber. She spread on some jam on her toast and stared at the egg. Michael pushed some coffee her way. Was all that Harper could muster. Without warning, the personal climbing sherpas entered the tent calling out names. Not sure if Harper was being recognized or punished, she stood up quickly and followed Nyingma out the door. He set a brisk pace through a, a maze of, of paths in the base camp. 
Switching on her headlamp, Harper followed closely, still unsure of what the, how to get to Crampon Point. With the, with the finesse of a lightweight boxer, Mingma weaved between the tents. He dodged a yak standing on the trail, careful not to touch the sleeping beast. After about 20 minutes, they reached the perimeter of base camp and took a step on a flattish section of the icefall. Harper was here a few days ago to run through her gear on the obstacle course, but this time it was for real. The route became circuitous, up and down small hills, stepping over small sections of running water, maneuvering around growing ponds. Careful not to get her boots wet, she took as big a steps as she could possibly do. Mima seemingly just floated over him. Her breathing increased. Tiny drops of sweat formed on her forehead. The doubts returned. Oh, my God, if I'm struggling just to get to Crampon Point, what will... Oh, Harper stopped herself, remembering the value of mental toughness. She and Mingma arrived at Crampon Point with the energy of a Formula One racing car coming into the race, coming into the pit for a tire change. Taking her crampons out of her pack, she sat, uh, she sat on it and then attached the spikes to her oversized boots. Right, then left, thread the safety strap around her ankle, through the ring, double back the strap. Mingma inspected her work. Feeling like a child, Harper also looked to make sure that she had put them on the correct foot. Buckles go on the outside for safety. Harper looked for Mingma, but he'd already moved on. The first few steps of the ice falls proper were steep. Who put a route over a 30-foot ice bump at the start? Harper said to herself, her breathing picking up. Mingma's headlamp seemed like a searchlight. He was not looking ahead, but side to side, using the eyes in the back of his head to see if Harper was keeping up. He slowed down a bit. Reaching the beginning of the fixed line, Harper took the carabiner attached to a piece of webbing fixed to her harness and clipped in. Harper would repeat this motion several hundred times over the next few weeks. Seeing more people ahead, she silently hoped that they would slow down her super Sherpa, who was quickly moving. Moving steadily, they gained altitude in the icefall. The wee hours of the morning were cold. It was dark. There was no moon tonight. Maybe for some at night? Hmm. The Sherpas often say a full moon is an auspicious sign. Headlamps showed the way, but so did the, the line of climbers ahead and the thin white nylon line, another part of climbing efforts that Harper would get to know well. Soon the conga line came to a halt. Actually, it was just Harper and Mingma because he has no patience for the slow climbers. He had passed each of them, pulling her along in his slipstream. They were the first of the Mount Everest guides group to get to this point. At this fast pace, Harper struggled to breathe, but Harper knew it was a good sign that they would reach the summit and not anything or anyone slow them down. Looking ahead, the emerging sunlight revealed the reason for their sudden stop, a ladder, a ladder, a ladder. Suddenly your mind became focused. No more idle thoughts, no more complaining, no more breathing. Harper just stared at a single ladder across the crevasse. In the dawn light, she could see how deep it was. Well, just as well. Nima looked at her as, as she took off her second carabiner off her harness. He went across first, clipping in the beaners to the two safety ropes on either side of the ladder. He stepped onto the first rung, then the second. And without so much of a pause, he was across, standing there staring at her. Harper could almost hear him in a deep John Wayne drawl. Okay, kid, I showed you how to do it. Now get on with it. <laughs> Harper leaned over and grabbed the safety line, left one first, clipping in. She felt now more secure than the right, even more secure. Moving her right boot off the snow, her front crampon points touched the first metal ring. A metal clink sound provided feedback. Her left foot followed, stepping on the second rung. Oh, Harper was now fully on the ladder, but now it was time to move. The death grip on the safety line hurt her hand, even though she was wearing thick gloves. She finally relaxed her grip. Her right foot inched forward, not too high off the ladder. But then she made a sudden decision to take one rung at a time, not two or three like Mingma. Her front points made a successful landing on the next rung, and the next, and the next. She felt good. She was proud of her baby steps. But then everything changed. Feeling panic, Harper sensed something was wrong. She, she stopped with her right foot ahead and her left foot behind, suspended in air. Harper looked over at Mingma, and then it occurred to her, breathe. Welcome to the icefall.